class a week ago. And I really had no idea that we would be sitting down to study Torah tonight, a little more than 24 hours after the horrific terrorist murders on Young Street. But everything is Ashgacha Pratis. I don't have any prophecy, I don't have any intuition, but Ashgacha Pratis that the subject that we're going to speak about tonight kind of directly impacts. It's, it's about as timely as it could be. And I guess I will preface tonight's class by saying that political correctness has nothing necessarily to do with the truth. <laughs> the truth is the truth whether it's politically correct or incorrect. I don't uh, seek political incorrectness. I don't, I'm not looking <laughs> for new friends or the opposite. I would become the target of people's <laughs> crusades and so on and so forth. But the truth must be said, and the Torah must be studied. And the idea that things that happen in the world and the weekly parsha should not in any way be linked and connected is not only inappropriate, it's actually heretical. Because, because if we believe in Parshas HaShavua, that Hashem speaks to us each week, and that we can find the inspiration and the guidance and the clarity, the moral clarity that's required in any particular time, if we can't find it in the Parsha, we're in trouble. Right? Like, like we believe that Hashem speaks to us. Didn't once speak to us, that the voice that Hashem spoke at Sinai is Kol Gadol Velo Yosef. It's a great voice. It doesn't end. It's a voice that continues to reverberate and continues to speak to us. And of course, the Torah is very vast. Where do you look for guidance and clarity at a particular time? We have the tradition from the Alter Rebbe, the Flood Midditzite. We have to live with the times, the Torah times. Anyway, so with all of this in mind, I'm going to direct you to open your Chumash to the second of today's doubleheader parshas. The parshiot are called Acharimot and then Kedoshim. Acharimot means after the death, which is especially eerie for us in Toronto tonight. So we're studying the parsha of Acharimot. And Kedoshim means holy ones or be holy. So we're going to be in Parsha's Kedoshim. And we're going to take a look in chapter 19 at the second half of verse 16. We're just going to study... Half a verse today. That's all. Just half a verse of our Holy Torah. So the verse opens with the words, Lo teilech rachil ba'amecha. You shall not be a talebearer or shall not go about bearing gossip, tales, and untruths about others. Which is very much connected to Lots of the things we talked about in last week's Torah portion of Tazria and Metzayra, and the reason that Saras comes because of slander and because of using our speech in a harmful way. So the Torah says, Loisei l'chirach necha. That should not be a way of life going around about and slandering others. And then the Torah says, Lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. Do not stand on the blood of your brother. I'm translating literally. It says, Lo ta'amod. This is a negative, a don't. Don't stand on the blood of your brother. Ani Hashem. I am God. So before I begin anything, I just wanted to point out that the Medrash Lekach Tov says on the words, Ani Hashem. Ani Hashem. Bedover shebeleiv nemer boy ani Hashem. The Medrash Lekach Tov says, that you will find this phrase numerous times in the Torah, at the, usually at the end of a prohibition or sometimes a litany of prohibitions. The Torah will say, God will speak to us and say, Ani Hashem, I am God. So of course I'm God. I told you to keep Shabbos, I am God. I told you to eat kosher, I am God. I told you to be nice to other people, I am God. He tells us to do things because He's God and because God desires for reasons really unfathomable to us human beings a relationship with us <laughs> like if I was God I wouldn't want to have a relationship with me but that's because I'm not God God desires and creates a relationship with me and with you and every one of us he loves every one of us he thinks we're fantastic he, he has the world 
uh, of expectation from us. In fact, he says, you should say, Bishvili nivra You should be going around saying at all times, the whole world was created just for me. The famous Rebbe of Peshischa said that in his pocket, he carries two papers, one in each pocket. One pocket that says, Anochi tolas v'layish, I am but a worm. Certainly not a mensch. Pasuk. And so in the other pocket it says, Bishvili nivra And he said, that's the way a person has to go through life with extreme humility, but at the same time with the knowledge and awareness that God created the entire world just for you. He's depending on you. As we say, God said to Jacob, and ultimately every, do, every Jew, Vihini Hashem Nitzavalov. Hashem is waiting on you. As the Medrash explains, waiting on you is waiting for you. God has enormous expectations, and we're supposed to perform in accordance with Hashem's expectations. Not our expectations of ourselves, which are usually significantly less than we're capable of doing. We seem to minimize our ability. We seem to make all kinds of excuses for not being more effective, for not doing more. But the truth is Hashem expects more from us. And Ani Hashem is when we're in a situation where we say, oh, I didn't know. I, 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 I couldn't have done anything. God says, yeah, Ani Hashem, like, <laughs> in case you forgot, I'm God. So I actually know if you could or could not have done. You can sell luxion, as they'd say, to anybody you want. You can tell stories to whoever you want. You can tell stories to yourself. You can believe your own baloney. But remember, I'm God. Me, you can't fool. So Ani Hashem, I am God, and I know exactly what you're capable and not capable of. So that's, on one hand, the notion of Ani Hashem, I am God. On the other hand, we have Rashi who comes along and says that specifically here, God tells us Ani Hashem. And the reason that he tells us Ani Hashem here is because he wants us to know, sorry, let's get to, he wants us to know that he is Nem on L'Shalem Schar. God says that I am trustworthy. So in case you think, this is really hard, God. I'm not going to be getting any accolades from my neighbors or friends. In fact, I might even be denigrated or attacked. I might be called a monster or a crazy person. Yeah, maybe. But God says, I have expectations from you. And I am Neaman L'Shalem Schar. I want you to know that I trust trustworthy. If I say do something and you did it because you knew it was the right thing to do, I will remunerate accordingly. At the same time, V'Neaman Lipara, I will also exact vengeance. We, we're responsible. And God will hold us responsible. And we will be held culpable. We'll be rewarded for what we did right. And we will have to answer someday for the things we didn't do. The sins of commission and the sins of omission. So that's the end of the verse. And you can bet your bottom dollar that if God finishes this verse with Ani Hashem, <laughs> Ani Hashem means I know the truth, and I will make sure that you will be held accountable for good or chas v'shalom not, that this verse is not going to be an easy verse to fulfill. Because if God had to tell us that, this is going to be a, a challenging and a difficult verse. So I don't want to focus um, on the Leisei L'chirach, on the Lashon Hara part, on the slander part. I want to focus on this mitzvah of Lo Tamud al Dam Re'echa, which is a mitzvah. It's a negative mitzvah of the Torah. Don't stand on your brother's blood. What does that mean? What does it mean to stand on your brother's blood? So if we look in the words of our sages, in the Torah Shabbal Peh, we actually have three possibilities in the meaning of lo tamad o dam reyecha. One possibility is, when somebody is trying to kill somebody else, what should we do? What should we do? Stop him? Oh, that's, that's easy for you to say. What if the only way to stop him is to kill him? Do I have the right to take somebody's life if he is about to kill somebody? He didn't kill him yet. Do I have the right to take his life? You think not. So first he should commit the act of murder, and then you'll kill him. So actually it's exactly the opposite. If he committed the act of murder, you're not allowed to kill him. Vigilante justice doesn't figure in Judaism. He has to be arrested, and he has to be tried, and convicted in a court of law. That's when the law kicks in. Punitive measures are not placed in our hands. We are not the court, the justice, 
the jury, we can't make decisions about guilt on our own. However, in a situation where a person did not yet kill somebody, he didn't commit a crime yet. He is about to commit a crime. It's clear he's trying to commit the crime. He's chasing somebody with a gun. He's shooting at him. You can shoot him. You're going to kill him, though. The person said, how did I get involved here? I should kill somebody? I should become a murderer now? He turns me into a murderer? I mean, am I allowed to spill his blood so he shouldn't spill somebody else's blood? Let, let, him, let him deal with God. Why should I get involved? And how could I kill somebody before he even killed? It's like I'm carrying out a punitive measure and the crime was never even committed. So there's one oral tradition that tells us that how do you know that you can eliminate a person, spill his blood, when that, he in, intends to kill somebody else? And incidentally, the Gemara tells us it's not only when he intends to kill somebody else, it's also when he intends to rape somebody else. He's trying to rape somebody, and the only way you can save the poor girl is by killing the guy, kill him. It's a mitzvah to kill him. It's not a mitzvah we sing and dance about. It's not a mitzvah that has any joy. You're not going to come home and be a hero for it, but it's the right thing to do. This is not any more joyous than the doctor who amputates a child's foot to save the child's life. But what was the right thing to do? To let the flesh-eating disease consume the child so the child is dead? Or to remove his foot, which is horrible, and the person will have to live with a prosthetic leg, but he can live for the rest of his life. Which is the better choice? Or let me... Let me put that differently. What's the right choice? What's the moral choice? Not what's the nice choice. Not what feels good. Or, or, or the, uh, the customs choice. The, 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 the country's choice. Oh, the country? I don't want to even talk about the country's choices. Uh, that, that, that's a very bad way to, d to deal with things. Because, because the, the society has consistently, over time, been wrong about a whole slew of things. And then when they get some things right, they get the other things wrong. Society has never yet got it all right. Never, ever. And they always seem to be in a state of confusion and there's always going from one extreme to the other extreme. We either nobody has any rights or criminals have all the rights. Both are profoundly wrong. Neither is the correct path. That's not the path of Torah. I'm only interested in what the Torah has to say, actually. I, I, I would like to know tonight, we're studying Torah. I want to know what is God's word. I believe this is God's word. These are not made by people. This is not something that somebody intuited. This is not a reflection of a particular time or place. Or philosophy. This is Hashem's Torah. So Hashem's Torah says that the words loy samay dal damri echa means don't stand by and say, "Ah, oh, I'm not going to kill this guy. How could I spill his blood? Why should I spill his blood? Why should I walk around later a murderer? I have to live the rest of my life knowing I, I took somebody's life." It's like the pediatrician saying, "I should try to cut the child's leg off. I'm out of here. I'm leaving the hospital. Find another pediatrician. I can never look at how am I going to look the child in the eye for the rest of his life? He looks at me. So you're the doctor. Took my leg off." I'll never be able to look at him again. You know what? I don't want to look at anybody. I don't, want to, I don't want to touch him. I don't want to be responsible for this. And the parents will come to you and say, please do it. Save a child's life. Oh, please, I can't be bothered. Or maybe the parents don't ask you. Or maybe you know what's going on. And you could just check out the back door. And say, what? Let somebody else do it. Why should I have to get my hands dirty? Why should I commit this dastardly deed? It is not illogical what I'm saying. It's wrong, but it's not illogical. Human uh, shall we say, the foibles of the human mind can come up with a solution like that. I don't want to deal with this. It's not my problem. I prefer to sit this one out. You could use in Torah literature, he'll say, Sheval Tasa Odif. Sheval Tasa means sit, do nothing. That's better. Sometimes inaction is better than action. Because if you take action, you may do the wrong thing. So do inaction. Don't do anything. The chips will fall, well, the chips will fall. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to take the affirmative action. I should be the one to pull the trigger. I should be the one to kill. I should be the one who spills blood. Why do I have to spill blood? Because I happen to be there? Because I happen to have a firearm? Because I happen to be a doctor? I signed up to save lives, not to chop people's legs and, and hands off. I don't want to do this. I'm not doing it. <clears throat> you want to do it? You, I'm out. Sheval Tasa. And then what if I cut off his leg and then he dies? And all I did is I gave him misery. I extended his life for a week without a leg. Did I need to do that? God's hands. God, you made him sick, you heal him, leave me alone. I'm out of it. So what does the Torah say? The Torah says it's wrong. Where do you see that? You see that in the words, Lo tam This is found in the Gemara in Mesechet Sanhedrin. In the beginning of page 73, there's a Mishnah. 
and the Mishnah is followed by Gemara afterwards. And I'm reading to you from the Gemara. Not Tanah Rabban and our Rabbis learn. How do you know when you see somebody chasing a fellow? How do you know you should kill him? Incidentally, chasing after him means that he wants to rape or murder somebody. Both, in both instances, we are not permitted. We are morally required to snuff out the life of a person who is at this moment still innocent because he didn't commit a crime yet. He is going to rape that girl if you don't do something, but I, I didn't rape the girl. He raped the girl. I, I, I had to get involved. I had to commit an act of killing to stop her from getting raped. He's the rapist. He's guilty. He let him answer to God. Let him answer to her. Why do I have to get involved? He would have killed somebody. He didn't kill anybody. So technically, was did I kill a guilty person or an innocent person? Why is he guilty? He didn't do anything yet. He had inten- intentions make you guilty? What if a person pulled out a gun and tried to kill somebody and did nothing but shoot a tree? And in the end, he never killed anybody. He had every intention of killing. He wanted to kill. He didn't kill anybody. He shot a mannequin instead of a person. He was convinced it was a person. He kept shooting the mannequin and saying, I'm so happy I killed you. I'm enjoying every shot. And he found it later. The whole thing was a, it wasn't a person. Is he technically guilty of murder? He didn't kill anybody. Here's a person who wants to kill. He didn't kill anybody. I should kill an innocent person? Why should I kill an innocent person? What did, what did I do to deserve this? And we'll come back to this later. The business of what did I do? Uh, I don't want to be the one. <laughs> I don't get my hands dirty. I don't want to soil my soul by being a murderer, a killer. I don't want to do that. I, I, I didn't sign up for this. So the Gemara says, how do you know? How do you know that's what God wants? How do you know it's the right thing to do? How do you know it's the moral thing to do? So the Gemara says, Talmud Leim, Rilei Samad Adam And the meaning of it is, don't, Ta'amod doesn't mean to stand on. In Hebrew, the word Ta'amod means to kind of freeze. Like we would call in English, stand down. Stand down. Don't move. So a person shouldn't say, lo ta'amo, don't stand down. I'm standing this one out. I can't get involved. I can't, I'm sorry. I, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not willing. I'm unwilling to be the murderer, the killer. You want to say, I'm not a murderer? Fine, I feel like one. I don't want to do this. So the Torah says you're not allowed to. What should I do? Instead of having compassion on the person who's trying to rape, instead of having compassion on the person who's trying to kill, who should you have compassion on? On the woman who's going to get raped, Nebuch. On the guy who's going to get killed. That's who you should have compassion on. So that's the first meaning of Lotam Adodam Reyech. The same idea is also expressed in the words of the Torah Kohen. Lotam Adodam Reyech. How do you know somebody who's going, running after somebody to kill him? The Torah Koinim is more expre- explicit. And after a male to sodomize him. And after a male to sodomize him. Betrayed a maiden, a young woman, to rape her. How do you know? How do you know that your chayav atel hatziloi, how do you know you're obligated to save that person, the nafshay, with this one soul? You have no right to stand down. You have no right to say, oh, I'm going to stand back. I'm not going to do it. You have no right. So I'm morally obligated to do something about this. This is the first way of understanding this Pasuk. Another way to understand this Pasuk of Leitamad Ladam follows along a different kind of trajectory, which is talked about primarily in the Teres Kainim and also in the Gemara and Mesecha Sanhedrin on page 73. I'll read it to you from the Teres Kainim where it's most explicit. Uminayin imraita tovea binohar. And how do you know if you see a person drowning in the river? O listim bayamala, where he's getting mugged by armed robbers. Or chayera, or a predatory animal. A killer animal. Comes to kill. Ba'alav, is attacking him. How do you know chayev ato lahat siloi? How do you know you're obligated to save him? How do you know? So I don't want to do that. I'm not going to fight with a lion. These guys are armed. They're crazy. I don't, I don't want to get involved here. I'm out of here. You can't stand by when your brother's blood is being spilled. If somebody's going to get killed. So I couldn't be bothered. I can't get my hands dirty. I can't. Who might he get involved in this? 
I don't have a responsibility. I don't have an obligation. You know, if you took the Hippocratic Oath and you drive by a car accident and you didn't get out of your car, you actually are committing a crime. Because part of the Hippocratic Oath is that since you learn medicine, since you have med proficiency in medical sciences, that if you're ever able to help, you're obligated to help. The doctor will say, I, you, know, you know what my insurance is like these days? Maybe he's going to sue me. I don't know if I can help him. I can try. And anyway, I relate to my golf game. Oh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I don't want to get my hands dirty. I'm on the way to a wedding. I'm going to get a dirty shirt now. I'm going to come to the wedding all bloody. I'm not doing this. I say, hey, what are you, out of your mind? You're a doctor. Saving a life is higher than every ideal. It's more important than your clean shirt. It's more important than your golf game. It's more important than anything. This is my wedding. This is, this is human life. Human life comes first. But the guy has a gun. <laughs> this, who knows what's going to happen here? You're able to save it? You can't say it's not my problem. It's not my problem. I can't do anything about this. I can't be bothered. This is, in certain circles, this has become the moral approach. Moral attitude is, I don't know, I don't know. Who am I to judge? I don't know. You know, one man's terrorist, another man's freedom fighter. I, I can't get involved. I don't know. I'm ambival I love everybody. I'm ambivalent. I can't, I can't, I don't, I don't know. It's all, it's all good. Who am I to get involved? May, may, maybe, maybe the person who's getting killed did something not nice to the person who wants to kill him, and, and maybe he's not well, so, you know, not, I, can't, I can't get involved. So, the, the Gemara Teres Karen who comes along, and the Gemara tells us specifically, you see that happening, you have a sacred duty and obligation to get involved. And then there's a third interpretation. And the third interpretation is very, very different than the first two. The Tagum Yonis and Ben Azil follows along these lines, and it's also found in the Torah's Koranim. And that is, how do you know that if you have testimony to offer, which could actually save somebody's life, but it's a criminal case, you don't get involved. So you go to the courthouse and be tied up in this court case. Hear no evil, see no evil. I don't know. Or, really, in the way that Teres Kurenim talks about it, you know a situation with somebody, you have information that it's, there's some bad people out there trying to kill somebody. You could tip off this person. But what if the mafia finds out who tipped them off? Mm. And what if they come back to you after this? Why should I get involved? Why should I do this? Is it my fault that I happen to overhear this? Leave me alone. I'm, I'm, keep, count me out. Just make, I didn't I hear no evil, see no evil. I'm not aware of anything. And in fact, according to this, that's what they say, there's a connection to the concept of, of Rechilus. The Orachayim. It's, uh, the origin is Tagim Yenis in Benazil, Teres Kainim. The Arachayim brings this out, as the, the, the Torah Aruch speaks about this as well. And the Arachayim says that this is a continuation of the first part of the verse, which speaks about the idea of Rechilus, talks about the idea of gossip, and you overheard something. And Layam Edel Dam Recha means don't stand by when your brother's blood is being imperiled, means Ra Kat Achas Sheretzim Lirzoyach. You see a group, and they want to kill, they have murderous intent, they have every intent of doing this nefarious deed. They want to rub the guy out. So you have a responsibility. You have to go tell the guy. Say, mister, I don't know how to tell this to you. Don't go. They're planning to kill you. Well, prove that to me. Do whatever you want. I'm just telling you, I did my job. I'm telling you, having a good authority, you're walking into a death trap. Bad idea. Don't do this. And you have to do it. A person shouldn't have said, I should say gossip. <laughs> I should be the one to be a talebearer? Maybe they were joking. Maybe they're just going to threaten the guy. I mean, they, they said they're going to kill him, but uh, who am I to know? And says, It says, don't be a, 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 a slander. Don't be a, a gossip monger. Don't bear tales. I happen to overhear something. I have to go tell him, Lush and Hara, that people are trying to kill him. Why would I do that? I'm a moral person. I don't betray secrets. How if you know? Somebody told me. What are you talking about? What should I do? A guy came to me. He said, Rabbi, do I have a rabbi client privilege? Or a rabbi client privileges? I'm planning to kill this guy tomorrow. I just said I should let you know, Rabbi. But please don't tell anybody. Rabbi client privileges. I'll sue you, Rabbi. You're not allowed to tell anybody. I just said I needed to confess to you before I do it. And I want you to know it because it's not my fault. He deserves it. He had an affair with my wife. I'm going to kill him now. Okay, Rabbi? That's okay, right? Uh, no, Harry, it's really not okay. I don't think you should do that. Um, you got a problem on your hands, but murder is not the answer. Rabbi, you know, I just, I'm just telling you. I'm just. I, I'm not going to be able to control myself. I'm going to be temporarily insane, so it's not my fault anyway. I'm just, I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. What's my responsibility now? My responsibility is to do everything possible to save the guy's life. But Larry's a bad guy. Larry had an affair. Larry's a terrible guy. 
Yeah, he may be a terrible guy. But that doesn't mean Harry can kill Larry because la- Harry's Harry and Larry. That doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. So, so I should be the Lush and Horror Bear? I should be the one to call on Harry and that he's wants to kill Larry? <laughs> it's anyway Susie's problem. She had the affair. Why do I have to deal with it? I'm getting involved, get my hands dirty. Who needs this? No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. That doesn't make you a moral person. Say, I don't want to get involved. You have to get involved. You have responsibility to get involved. Somebody's life's in danger. Don't come along with this all of a sudden, this uh, smug morality. You know, he has to die. Maybe he has to die. If God wants him to live, good God save him. It's my problem. <laughs> why, do, why do I have to deal with this? I signed up to be a rabbi to answer Shilas. If I didn't sign up to a rabbi to deal, get involved with crazy people who want to kill others, it's not my thing to do. I don't, I don't want to get involved. So these are the three approaches. Three approaches. We have these, these, these three ideas, three ideals that the Pasuk is teaching us. And it's all straight from the oral tradition. In the words of the Rambam, he says very, very clearly that if a person, if a person commits a crime, a person commits a crime, we can't kill him. The witnesses can't kill him. It doesn't work like that. It's due process. We live in a just society. If somebody commits a crime, they'll be arraigned in a court and he'll be dealt with according to the law. Take him to Bezden. He didn't know the Misa. What should he get? The death sentence, by the way. Not life imprisonment. Not the taxpayer should be paying his lunch while he watches Tom and Jerry cartoons for the rest of his life. No, no, no. He needs to be put to death because he's a murderer. But that has to go through due process. When is this the case, says the Rambam, in Hilchas Retzei Echoshmiras Nefesh? When the crime was already committed. So then, that's what you got to do. You live in a, a just society, law and order has to reign. If he's trying to kill him. Either when he's trying to kill a major, a minor, a filohi, a of cotton. Even if the person is a child and children are held culpable. And even if you'll bring him to court, he's a child. And the child will not be put to death. Because a child cannot be held responsible for violating the law. Yeah, there are nine-year-old murderers these days. He's a nine-year-old murderer. He's got a knife. He's chasing somebody. He saw it on television. He played his video games. He heard on the, on the news that everybody who does this is crazy. He decided today he's crazy. He has grievances. He's angry. He's been bullied in school. He has the right now to take out his anger and do this. And he'll get sympathy from the world. The world will call him insane. Then what was his motive? But do I care what his motive is? What was his motive? Is it because they took away his lunch? Or is it because they locked him in a room and mocked him? I don't care what his motive is. I care that he's a murderer. Mitamol, I need motives? What does the motive do for me? What difference does it make? What difference does it make why he had a grievance? I don't know. It makes a difference. What difference does it make? Honestly, I don't understand it. So you have a child over here. If this child's going to be brought to the court of law, what will happen to this child? He's not going to be convicted. You can't convict a child. Children cannot be held fully culpable. Parents could be held culpable. Children can't be held fully culpable. Nonetheless, this child is trying to kill somebody. Every single member of Am Yisrael, if you want to be a moral person, from a Torah perspective, this is a mitzvah that applies to every single Jew equally. Every single one has a mitzvah. You know what your mitzvah is? I didn't say it's joyous, I didn't say it's happy, I didn't say it's pretty, I didn't say it's clean, I didn't say it's nice. I said it's moral. A mitzvah means a commandment from God. Are what we're obligated to do. What I'm obligated to do. What am I obligated to do? I'm obligated, I'm obligated to save the would-be victim, from the hands of this would-be pursuer, this pursuer, this would-be murderer. Even if it means taking the life of a child who's trying to kill somebody. It's not a punitive measure. There's not vigilante justice. There was no crime committed yet. You cannot have vigilante justice. You can't have justice when a crime wasn't committed yet. But you can have an obligation. 
you have an obligation to save the would-be victim. So that I have a question. Yeah. How would the laws of the country handle that if you interfered by killing a would-be murderer, they could say you were acting as a vigilante. He hadn't done anything. And this is a end up in jail. This is a real problem. This is a real problem. It's a real problem. And what if not simple. Not simple. I'm telling you what the what the good book says. It's a problem. It's a problem when we live in a society that says we have to have compassion. As the famous Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid said in the name of his predecessors, Kol HaMerachim, Allah Achzorim, anybody who expresses compassion, you know, mercy, sensitivity, understanding, for those who are cruel, soifa, in the end, lehis achzer, that person will become cruel and indifferent and insensitive, neged rachmanim, to those people who are deserving of compassion. We have arrived. Our society has, makes heroism out of having compassion for heartless, cruel people. And then we tell the people who are victims, we'll pray for you. And we'll put flowers on your head. And that's really nice. What if there's a chance that you're going to be killed? You hang in there. We're not done this class yet. It's a very good question. What if there's a chance you're going to get killed? Like, we're going to talk about what the making of a hero tonight. And talk about, it's a good question. It's a very good question. So how does this work? So obviously you have to know for sure. It has to be, you have to have clarity. Like im hiziruhu. If you warn the guy, and he's running after him, he doesn't accept his warning. He says, don't do it. You're going to kill him. He says, don't tell me what to do. I have the right to kill him. He turned the lights off on me and locked me in a closet last week. I have the right to kill him. That school, they bullied me. I'm going to kill those students now. I'm going to show them who's boss. I'm going to show them. So, so in that case, since he's a redif, he's got to get killed. Now get something very interesting. The Ram says, well, what if you can kill him by incapacitating him? Maybe shoot him in the leg, in the heel, instead of shooting him in the head. So he says, again, hit him with an arrow. Or be'evan, hurl a stone at him. Besayef with a sword, v'yiktu yoday, you chop off his hand, not his head. Or yishbu raglav, break his legs. Or yisam oenav, use pepper spray, blind him. Oisin, they should do that. You should do that, obviously. Why should you kill somebody? If you could stop, the, per- the point here is not to carry out justice. The point is not to carry out a punitive measure. The point is to save somebody innocent from losing their life or from being violated. That's the point. And what if a person kills him anyway? Then you're a murderer. That's, that's wrong. But if you can't do it any other way, if you can't, you have to. You have to do what has to be done. On one occasion when I was in the firing range uh, here at, at the training facility at York Regional Police, I pointedly make sure to forget the name of this instructor in case I ever got asked a question from anybody. I, I have no idea who he was. So I can't be asked. I can't be pulled into a court of law. I don't, remember what, I don't remember who he was, but I asked him. He's showing us how to shoot. I said, and they're teaching you to aim for the sternum. That's what they teach the cops. Aim for the sternum, which is basically the middle of the neck. Right in the middle, right above the chest. That's the, so I say to him, why do, we aim, why do you teach us to aim for the sternum? So he says, because that's the biggest area of body mass that can be lethal. That can, you're definitely going to stop the guy. A bullet in that area is going to stop him for sure. By the way, bullets are not as powerful as you think they are. The bullet of a Glo- I saw the bullet of a Glock go through a bottle of orange juice, and the bottle of orange juice is still standing after. Mm-hmm. The orange juice is draining out. But I really did. It's not, it's not so simple. Like not, not every, a shotgun is going to tear a, you know, a six millimeter hole or something. The bullet is like, a, it's like the, the very powerful, go right through. It's not necessarily going to stop the guy. But that's an area that's going to stop him. So I said to him, really? Like, don't we aim for the feet? I don't know. I was like, I'm a student of Torah. What I know from, so we aim for the feet? So the guy tells me, <laughs> he says, only the crazies in Israel do that. Mm-hmm. The rest of us aim for the sternum. That's what the words, I think it was an Irish guy. He says, only the crazies in Israel. Oh, they're crazy, he says in Israel. They're crazy over there. So we just aim for the sternum. I said, but would you like to kill a guy? 
He's, I have four seconds to respond. I don't know what's going to be the guy. I have, I have innocent lives to protect. I got to stop this guy. I got to stop this guy. He's what do you think? I come at the people come at the range every single day with their sharpshooters. The police officer goes once a month. He's lucky. He said he's got to shoot for the body mass, whatever he can hit. It's, 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 in, it's in the moment. It's in the, it's, it's, there's, 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 there's unbelievable pressure. You got to stop this guy. So if we start to make calculations, we shoot him in his toe or shoot him in his... In the meantime, there's a chance you won't stop him. And because of that, an innocent person will lose their life. The Rambam says this is a mitzvah lo taseh. This is a negative commandment in the Torah. What's the negative commandment? Lo lachlus al nefesh haroidif. Not to have any compassion. Compassion here is misplaced. Do not have compassion for a would-be murderer. He's a roidif. It's very sad and unfortunate, but he has lost the right to human dignity and life and liberty. End of story. The Rambam tells us that this is echad roidif whether this would-be criminal is trying to kill or he's running after a young maiden and he wants to rape her. And we know this because the Torah likens the concept of rape to murder. Deuteronomy 22, verse 26, the rape victim, nothing should be done to her. You have in today's day and age demented societies that punish women for being raped, publicly caning them. And some of these twisted, perverted societies even stoning them. Heaven for offend. Torah says, What does she do? She's a victim. This is just like somebody who would rise up against another person to murder them. The Torah calls sexual abuse murder. How's that for enlightened? How's that for women's rights? That a woman being raped is like an act of murder. So the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Dafa'in Gimel says, that we draw a direct link between saving a woman from rape and saving somebody from murder. Same thing. Same principles apply. It's not about a punitive measure. It's not about doing something that the person deserves. You commit an act of rape, you deserve to be killed. No, that's not, that's not what it's about. It's about preventing somebody else from being violated and suffering. And the Torah, in its, in its compassion for a woman who could be a victim of rape, Rahman al <coughs> says, a monster who would do that deserves to be killed if that's what it takes. In other words, it's not really about him deserve to be killed, it's about she deserves to be saved. And she deserves to be saved even if it comes on his on the expense of his life. That's his problem, not her problem or the rescuer's problem. It's self-understood, at least in the meantime, that if there's a hostage situation and the hostages would be killed by police bullets, not the bullets of the hostage takers, that who ultimately committed the murder? Who would be held culpable and guilty? The hostage takers, the terrorists. Why? Because here's law enforcement whose job is to try to save and they did their best. And it's tragic. It's tragic they didn't succeed. But who is guilty? Who created the situation? There's a very interesting Medrash Tillam that kind of takes this whole business in a little bit of a different direction and puts us in the situation, answers a, a very you know, profound question which people in the West ask today about, about war. What, what, what a soldier kills. A soldier does something wrong. So, Mizmer Nunvav, the 56th Psalm, begins with a Lam Natseach al Yoinas Elam, on a mute dove. A song by a mute dove. Who's a mute dove? Well, what is going on over here? Michtam le David, a, a song for De- King David. And it says, This is composed with the feelings that welled up in his heart, mind, and soul when he was in captivity by the Philistines, nothing to do with modern-day Arabs who've taken a version of that name, in a place called Gath. So what happened there? Well, what happened is that there was a, a general, some kind of military leader, head of a garrison, his name was Achish. And Achish took David captive when David was running away from Saul, King Saul. He went out to the wrong side of the border. And 
one of Achish's soldiers recognized David. He said, I know that guy. He killed my brother Goliath. He killed Goliath. I'm going to kill him now. And David and Melech at this time actually feigned insanity. So they wouldn't believe it's him. or wouldn't know it's him. Couldn't torture him. He made it as if he's insane. Takes a lot of guts to do it. But that's, that's what he did. We have a similar chapter of Tilim earlier. The David B'Shanesi, his time of Lefnavi Melech, he made himself insane over there. So it says he was like a mute dove. Do- David couldn't say anything. And he was far away from anybody who could help. Gibar Choykemimenu, the mighty warriors, his friends, they were far away from him. So he's helpless. And it says, he sang to Hashem, he cried out to Hashem, what's a michtam? What's a michtam? So the Medrash Tillam says, machvatam. Machvatam means he was humbled, made low. He was like sincere. He says, I, I, I got no way out of this. And Hashem makes a miracle. Achish, suddenly has an idea. Hashem puts an idea and Achish said, Achish says to Goliath, his brother, well, you know, when Goliath agreed to this duel, it wasn't exactly, they weren't having coffee. David and, and, and Goliath, David and Goliath face off. It was like, David knew either he's going to get killed or he's going to kill. And Goliath knew, well, he didn't think he's going to get killed. He, was, he came to kill David. What did you want David to do? So if David had his life threatened, he didn't do anything wrong. He defended his own life. And in this way, the arguments against David are quelled. And at the end, David and Malach is saved. So there's a broader context here, which is not already in Pshat. This is more like in a Medrash. There's a broader context, which is connected to L'Sam Adel Dam the, the Medrash Tilm actually references the Pasuk here. It says, V'chein Uwe Me'l'Sam Adel Dam Riecha. So if I shouldn't stand by, by somebody else's blood, I might stand by my own blood. I'm not going to get killed, so I, I, can't, I, couldn't, you know, I couldn't pull the trigger. If you have to kill me, you, you do it. I couldn't pull the trigger. Maybe Gandhi would say something like that. But Gandhi's not Moses. He's like, with all due respect to Gandhi and his philosophies, Gesundheit, you know, like, uh, Gandhi also wrote a letter. There's a letter I saw printed recently somewhere telling the Jews uh, you know, not to resist Hitler, not to fight him. And a letter to her Hitler, my friend here, Hitler calls him my friend. Shocking. Actually shocking. Really shocking. Maybe Gandhi would say, no, we have, we have to be nice. If you feel you have to kill me, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to be brought low. I'm not going to become a murderer. You want to be a murderer? That's your thing. It's your karma. Yeah, I'm not going to be brought low. No, that's Meshuggah. If somebody comes to kill you, it's your duty to kill him first. You have to preserve your own life, even if it comes at the hands of somebody else. Now, if somebody comes to you and says, you shoot him or I shoot you, what's your halacha? Yeah, you have to die. You, you cannot save your life by somebody else. If somebody comes along and says, uh, you know, this is, this is the option. There's no other options for you. For me, it's an optionless option. Sorry, I don't have any options. But that's when they ask me to kill an innocent person, which is by Torah d- d- dictate murder. This is not murder. This is kill. When you kill somebody who's a would-be murderer, you're not a murderer. You may have killed. You didn't murder. Why? Because that person had baleful intent. They wanted to kill. If somebody wants to kill and somebody else kills them before they get to kill, they're not a murderer. They may be a killer. They killed technically, but they're not a murderer. A soldier is not a murderer, even though the soldier technically ends up being a killer, tragically. And we talk about wars, at least in the Western world, we try to talk about moral wars. When you're fighting an evil. Evil, the the last time the world had any kind of moral clarity was over 70 years ago, when the world fought Hitler. That's why everybody kind of reverts back to Nazi and Hitler. Everybody you don't like is a Nazi and a Hitler. Why? Because that was the last time anybody had any kind of clarity. Ever since, it's been one big state of confusion. And hardly any of, if any of the wars fought in the last 75 years were really justified outside of Israel's wars of defense. Was the Vietnam War justified? What was the point? What was accomplished? Was Russia's war in Afghanistan justified? I mean, like, uh, which of these wars is moral? Which of the wars was a smart thing to do? Which was a good thing to do? Was the war in North Korea a smart thing to do? I, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be an expert. I'm not even giving my opinion because I don't know. <coughs> but then again, the American soldier in Vietnam had no choice. If he's going to stand down, what was going to happen to him? He's going to get killed. What was his choice? He had no choice. He's not a murderer. He's a soldier. Thrust into battle. Well, he has to trust his country. His country sent him off to war. He has no choice. 
His, his commander-in-chief sent him. Now, and he's in a situation where he has to kill or be killed, by golly, then you have to kill. It's tragic. It doesn't make him a murderer. So what does Rashi say about all this? What's, what's Rashi's take? I want to share with you the words of, of Rashi's uh, grandson. Rashi's grandson, Rashbam, he follows the first approach. First approach, he said, this is about... You have to save him by spilling his blood. Save him by spilling his blood. It doesn't make, you have to kill. You're not a murderer. Spill the guy's blood. Don't let him carry out his nefarious intentions. Rashi has a very different take on this whole thing. He follows the second approach. But as you're going to see, Rashi modifies the words of the Medrash and the Torah Kornim. In what seems superficially to be an absolutely mysterious fashion. So here's the words, here's Rashi's commentary. You can follow along inside of the Chumash. This is in the, in the, again, chapter 19, second half of verse 16. So Rashi says, you're in a situation where your fellow, an innocent person, is right now in a circumstance where your fellow, an innocent person, is right now in a circumstance of extreme danger. He's fighting for his life. And you're there. You're there. That's the background. So you're there, and the Torah says to you, don't stand this one down. Don't stand by, not on the blood of the would-be murderer here, but we speak here about the blood of the innocent. To see his death. And you could save him. You're watching his death, but you could save him. Kigoyin, for example, you see somebody drowning in a river. And a beast or robbers are basically coming up against him. So what should you do? You should save him. And Mark asked a very good question. He says, well, I'm not required to risk my life. Why should I risk my life? Why should I, I mean, I'm sad the sky is in danger, but why should I become in danger? Why? Am I, am I obligated? So here's the thing. Rashi's, Rashi's interpretation is one of the three interpretations offered in Chazal. Right? He's following the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 73. He's following the Torah Kohenim, which is the Medrash Halacha, the Sifra, that accompanies the book of Leviticus. But Rashi makes several major changes. He changes the language of our sages. What do our sages say? In the Torah's Kayanim it says, Imra'isa toivea banahar, you see him drowning in a river. Oy listim boyom alav, or armed robbers are coming. Oy chayera ba'alav, or a bad animal, a, a murderous animal, what you would call a killer animal, a lethal animal coming against him. Chayavat al-atziloi, you have to save him. Even if benafshe, you're, you're risking your own life. So the language of our sages is chayav. What does chayav mean? Chayav. Chayav means obligated. Patur or chayav. Exempt or obligated. Chayav. You're obligated. Obligated. What does Rashi say? He never uses the word obligation. He says, Lisam et al means, Lira is b'misosoy, to see his death. Va'ata yochalat and you could have saved him. And then he gives examples. Kigoyin, for example. Why doesn't he use the language that's found in the Talmud? The language of the Gemara and the language of the Teres Kainim. The Gemara says, The Teres Kainim says, Anyway, Rashi could use a shorter language. So if you don't want to use the language of the Torah Kordim, which is Chayev Atel so you just say the words Chayev Lahatzilay. It's shorter, but still Chayev. Chayev, that's a big word, by the way. It means obligated. What's my obligation? You know, one of the saddest things I heard about this whole story there on Young Street, that there's one of the, one of the drivers said, I saw this happening, and I, I feel so horrible that I didn't ram the car. He said, I could have rammed the car. There was no secret what this guy was doing. He was killing people. He was on a rampage to kill. So the right thing is to gun the acceleration and, and kill this guy. Do whatever it takes. 
because he was going to kill people. And he was like frozen. I can't, I can't judge him. Nobody could judge a person. In, 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 in a, who knows? Would I have the courage, the fortitude, the, have my wits about me to know what to do? The guy he was, wasn't driving slowly. He was driving very quickly. It'd have to be an extraordinarily capable, focused, you know, person with, ex- with exceptional samfra and like, you know, I would say you have to be somebody with training to do something like that. But the guy kept, he was like weeping. He's like, I, I, I can't forgive myself. So the Gemara would say to him, Chayev, you were obligated. So his Kareinim would say, Chayev. Rashi doesn't use the word Chayev. For some reason, he dropped this word. Why did he do that? Rashi doesn't make up his own Torah. Rashi is interpreting, but really restating the words of our sages. Another question the Rebbe asks. Chazal, our sages, introduce three possibilities to describe the circumstances here. Situation number one or I should say possibility number one. Raisa Teveya Benohar. You see he's drowning. Situation number two. How do you say in Hebrew or? No, or, or in Hebrew is light. In English you say or, or. So I say he was drowning or he was being attacked by armed robbers or he was being attacked by a wild animal. There was a cougar on the loose, a cheetah, a black panther, I don't know. A lion. So, how do we say in Hebrew, or? O. Olive of O. So, actually, that's what the, that's what the Torah's Kranim says. Toiveya benohar, one. Oi, or. Listim, boyim alav. Armed robbers are coming to get him. Oi, chayero alav. Or, a wild animal. A bad animal. But really, animals aren't bad. Only people are bad. Animals are animals. But the bad animal means an animal who's a destroying animal, a killer animal. The animal who's a predatory animal. This is a, a predator who kills. Call him a It's an expression. It's a euphemism. It's not about good and bad. It doesn't go to animal heaven or not. It's not, it's not the point. He's a, he's a lion. He's not a bad lion or a good lion. But an animal, a lion, is a chayera. He's a wild animal. A bad animal. Meaning a dangerous animal in English. So it's a dangerous animal. It's one of three circumstances. What are you going to do? You do. Dangerous animal. There's a lion on the loose. There's a guy with a gun. A lunatic, a mugger. He's fearless. He's got a gun. Or he's walking out a big knife. He's a terrorist. He's going and stabbing people. He's making his famous declarations, which I'm not allowed to say online, unless I get put in jail for hate speech or something. Making his famous declarations and slashing people, beheading them, screaming and slashing like an animal. And you see this, you, and you see this poor guy, is, he's about to be attacked. What do you do? Well, somebody's drowning. He fell into the river, he's drowning. Three situations. Teres Koyinim is very clear, it describes three separate situations. And how do we describe three separate situations? With the word O. Oh. Here's the Gemara in Sanhedrin. Chaveri Shuteveh ben Nohar. Oh, chayera geratu. Geratu means that a, a, a dangerous animal has actually mauled him. Oh, he lists him by him alav. Well, so Rashi can choose one or the other. He can follow the Gemara's order or he can follow the Teres Karinim's order. In fact, Rashi goes first with the wild animal and he goes afterwards with the, with the armed robbers. Teres Karinim has a different order. Teres Karinim has the order of First he has the, rob, the armed robbers and then the wild animal. Fine, so he follows the order of the Gemara. But both in the Gemara and in the Torah's Karenim, it says three independent situations. A, B, or C. It's either one or the other or the other. Three different possibilities. Take a look at Rashi. What does Rashi say? Rashi says, It doesn't say anything about Chayev. And then he says, you got to look inside to see. This is like unbelievable. Kigoin, for example, Rashi says, Toiveya banohar, he's drowning in the river, v'chaya oilistim boyim, and an animal, and, not or, and an animal, or, while, or an armed robber. It's not like Rashi doesn't know how to use the word or. He uses the word or. He said there was a drowning, and, not or, and 
a wild animal mauling. So there's a guy is drowning and a crocodile is, has, a hold, has got, got a hold of him. Or there's some wild animal right on shore and he's drowning. And the animal's coming in after him. Or there's a lunatic with a knife. Or a gun. And he's on shore. So Rashi puts them together. <sighs> Why'd they do that for? Why would Rashi deviate from like this? Like The Gemara says a certain language. The Kingdom says the same language. That was clearly the tradition our sages had. What was, what was Rashi's point of modifying this? What was he trying to get at? So the Rebbe explains this in an exceptionally brilliant way, which is extremely relevant, extremely practical. And I'm giving you a very brief synopsis of a, a, a long and edited sikha that I had the privilege of being there when the Rebbe said it. And I remember him saying it. I remember, I remember him delivering that, this, 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 this teaching. But, but uh, this class is not an excuse. If possible, you should read the original sikha. It's a very, very nuanced, exhaustive, goes through many, many uh, different sources. I'm giving you the, the, the synopsis of it. The synopsis is as follows. Rashi here does not speak of a typical situation in which a person is what we call obligated. You cannot say that this pasuk comes to teach me that I'm obligated to save somebody's life. You know why not? Like the Gemara itself asked the question. I need this pasuk, I need this verse to teach me that I'm obligated to save somebody's life? What if that wouldn't have this pasuk? What if I wouldn't have this verse? Would I not know that I should save somebody's life? I mean, I'm really, it's really glad it says L'sham Dabriecha. Because otherwise, if I'd be standing at Lake Ontario and seeing somebody drown, I would say, hey, have a nice life. The guy says, you're not trying to save me. I really can't be bothered. So, so. But yeah, but you took life-saving. Uh, yeah, I did. But, I, you know, I'm wearing Gucci shoes. I don't want to jump in the water. I'm like, uh, and if I kick him off, somebody could steal him. It's, it's okay. Let somebody else jump in. I don't have to jump in for do you need a special pasuk that says Lysam ad to teach you that? Let me tell you why you don't. Because you have another pasuk that tells you that if somebody lost $100 or a dollar, it's a mitzvah for you to return that money to him. It's a mitzvah. It's, it's actually you're morally obligated to the point that if you found somebody lost money and it's going to be a huge pain in the neck for you to go find the original owner, that you don't have the right to say, oh, here, no evil, see no evil, I don't want to know from this. You saw it, you found it, your mitzvah. My time is worth more than $100 an hour. It's going to take me two hours to do this. The lawyer says, I'm making 750 bucks an hour. I have to run after, spend two hours now trying to chase this guy down to return his $100 to him? What's our answer to him? A mitzvah is priceless. It's a mitzvah. You have a ritual sacred duty to return a lost item. So tell me, his money I should return to him, but his life? Eh, can't be bothered. Would that make sense? You could save somebody's money. You save his money. His life. Now you're asking too much already. That's senseless. The Gemara asks a question. Somebody gets sick. Huh? Should you heal? What do you think? Were you really? Of course. Who made him sick? Hashem. How does God heal him? I should meddle in God's business? God made him sick. Will God heal him? That's not impossible for somebody to come up with that idea. It's just wrong. <laughs> How do we know it's wrong? Because the Torah says it's wrong. The Gemara says we have two verses that teach us that that's a wrong approach. One is that the Torah specifically talks about doctors. And the Torah says somebody is injured, verapa yurape. It's a mitzvah to heal him. So the Torah specifically says the doctor is doing a sacred duty, verapa yurape. But the Gemara has another reason. The Gemara says, I don't understand. If somebody lost money, you don't say, well, it's God's, it was God's will, he lost money. If God wants to give him money, God will throw him money down his chimney. It's my business. So no, you saw the money being lost. You could return the money to him. You have an obligation to do it. So the Gemara says, tell me something. His money I have an obligation to return. And his health I don't. It's true. Most people ruin their health chasing money. And then spend the rest of the money trying to find the health. That's not really true. That's one of the foibles of humanity. One of the crazinesses. As the famous uh, Spanish poet, what was it... Uh, Ibn, Tibin, uh, Ibn Gabirol, I think. He wrote, Ha'adam doig al ibodamav, the person worries all day, has anxiety about the loss of his money. Ve'eni doig al ibodamav, but he worries not about the loss of his hours or days. 
<laughs> he says, Domov Einam Oizrim, money doesn't help. The Yom of Einam Chayzrim, and the days, the time doesn't come back. As Lama Adam Doig, Aliba Domov, the Yeni Doig, Aliba Yomov. Why does he worry a whole day? I lost a hundred dollars. Don't worry, I lost an hour. You wasted an hour doing nothing. One hour, Halavai be an hour. People waste a whole life doing nothing. They spend a whole life going from a movie to Candy Crush to Facebook. <laughs> and then they're just getting started. And then they have to see Snap, Snapchat. And don't forget about Instagram. There's important stuff going on there. So what did you do all day? Oh, I did a whole day. You should only know how much things I saw, what I knew. I became so smart. You just wasted a whole day for heaven's sake. If it, to go and save $10, you drive to the other end of town, spend $11 on gas because there's a sale for $10 somewhere. For heaven's sake. You waste all that time to save 10 bucks and you lose a day without thinking twice. Okay, this is the lunacy of people. Destroy their health in the pursuit of their career, and then they finally make money, and now they spend all the money paying the doctor so they should be able to regain their health. Maybe just take care of yourself to begin with. I shouldn't talk. Anyway, the bottom line is, <laughs> the bottom line is that people do a lot of stupid things. So if you could return somebody's money to him, what's the mitzvah? The mitzvah returns money to him. What if you could restore not his money, but you could restore his health to him? Is that Shiloh? Is that a question? Anybody's right mind, it'll be a mitzvah to restore somebody's health? Is it God's problem? God made him sick. God will heal him. I'm such a, I'm such a strong believer, you know. I have tremendous emunah. I have tremendous faith in Hashem. So, I have so much faith in Hashem that when the person comes to me and he says, excuse me, could you give me tzedakah? I'm like, what do you eat tzedakah for? He said, what do you mean? I'm hungry. Oh, Hashem will feed you. <laughs> I have so much faith in Hashem. The guy says, I have no money. I'm, I, I can't pay my rent. Hashem will pay your rent. Just have faith, friend. Everything's great. That's, that's, a, that's an object of faith. They once asked the Magid, they said, is it true that the Rabbi the Baal Shem to said, every 30, everything you see, today's a yom yom, everything you see is a lesson of Eid Hashem? Magid said, yeah. So they said to the Magid, so what could you learn when you meet an atheist? The Magid said, I'll tell you what I can learn. When I meet an atheist and a poor man comes and he says, please, could you give me some money for tzedakah? He doesn't say, talk to Hashem. <laughs> he doesn't rely on God. He opens his wallet and he gives him a few bucks. He says, then, then behave like an atheist. Somebody is sick, behave like an atheist. You pray for him later on. Now do something for him. In the real world. God is not real. God is very real. It's your mitzvah now. God wants you to act. He gave you the mitzvah. You restore his health. You bring him back his lost item. Hechfrega pashta shaylam ask a simple question. His money you have to return. His health you have to return. His life? Now you're asking too much. Is there any logic to that? Does make any sense? So why do I need this pasuk for? I need this pasuk to tell me that if somebody's drowning in a river. So Rashi comes along and he says, it's not a question of chayev. It's not a question of chayev. And incidentally, what if I'm going to jump into the river and drown myself? Am I obligated to risk my own life? I don't know. I say, maybe I could save, maybe I drown. It's 50-50. I'm not obligated. That's where heroism begins. Heroism begins where obligations end. A hero is somebody who does something that he or she wasn't obligated to do. A hero is somebody who goes the extra mile above and beyond the call of duty. The call of duty is to do what you're required to do. Heroism is when you go beyond what you're required to do. But the Torah can't make you do that. The Torah can't demand that of you. What the Torah could say to you is, and this is why Rashi changes the words because he wants to be practical here. He says, practically speaking, what is the novelty of this verse? Pshuto shal mikra, understanding this verse on a simple, straightforward, uncluttered, unsophisticated, just like the straight goods. What did this pasuk tell me that I didn't know before? That I have to save somebody's life if I could? I don't need this verse for that. But what the verse did tell me is, I see him dying. Liriz b'misase. Rashi says, Va'ata yochoi lahatsiloi. You can definitely save his life. It's not a question about that. So Tevea Benor, the Rebbe says, is a perfect example of when you could know with fair certainty whether you could save his life or you can save his life. Let me give you an example. Somebody is drowning in the river. It's their, their dying throes. They're barely thrashing. They're, they're sinking. You don't know how to swim. In fact, you've never been in the water in your life. Should you jump in to save him? I should say not. We'll have two funerals the next day. What was the point? You're a meshugana if you jump in, a lunatic. 
But, but, there's a rope. And all you got to do is throw the rope and pull with all your might. And you know what? If you feel he's pulling you in, you're going to let go of the rope. Tell me, what is the issue? What's the issue? Why wouldn't you save him? I'm wearing Gucci shoes. It's a lot of mud. It's uncomfortable. What if, uh, what if, what if I get pulled close to the river? Hey, Miss Miss Sugar, you, you can save a life. You'll do your best you could. If you'll feel you're pulling to the end, you'll be very careful. You let go of the rope at the end. You took a course in life saving. You're an excellent swimmer. You know how to swim. If the guy is going to get a hold of you, you'll, you'll figure your other way out. Yeah, but what if uh, lightning strikes at that moment? That's not a reasonable doubt. I could save him. says Rashi. You see him dying, you could save him. Here's the problem. The problem is, while he's, while he's dying, there's a wild uh, leopard over here. There's, going after, there's a crocodile involved here. I'm going to pull him out and then we both have to face the crocodile. There's a lunatic screaming, something's great. And he's running around and he's stabbing people. I'll pull this guy out of the water. Then I, I can either run away from that guy. Or... Understand? It's a compounded situation. Right now I could save this person. What will happen as a result? Maybe we'll both be in danger afterwards. But right now I can save this person. So the question is what do I have to do right now? I have to save this person. And this is an obligation that I have. But maybe I'm going to be in danger afterwards. Yeah, but that's like... Every day is a gift and every, every moment is a moment in danger. Right now I could save somebody's life. Right now I have to save his life. What if it will be a situation where I could actually lose my life? God forbid. I'm not obligated to jump in then. And that's why Rashi doesn't divide the cases. He says this is a compounded situation. This is a, this is a, this is a difficult, nuanced set of circumstances. There's drowning in the river and, not oi, the, one of two things. Rashi understood, understands the words of our sages that what, in the way, at least that the, the way Rashi understood it, the Rebbe maintains, that he says, You're seeing him die. You could save him. What would that mean? And there's a crocodile on the prowl. Like alligator. There's an Everglades. Dangerous stuff. There's armed robbers, people who are roaming in the area over here. I got to get out of this place. It's dangerous. So right now the guy's drowning. Yeah, I know, but the, I just heard somebody screaming, great, great, and a uh, slashing guy. I gotta get out of here. He's so, dying. He's dying. You have to save him. Save him. How could you not save him? And that is not a hero. <laughs> that, that's a mensch. That's what you're obligated to do. So when you have both of these situations together, the first question is, can I save this person? Answer the question, yes or no? The answer is yes. Rashi says, You have no right to stand this one out. I can't get involved. Can't get involved. Don't stand down. You need to do something now. You see a situation happening. You need to do something. So what is the broader implication of this? The broader implication is that we have an obligation to save innocent lives. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a nice or compassionate thing. It's actually an obligatory thing. We have an obligation. And we have an obligation to save innocent lives. And if there is a person who is not innocent, and the only way to save innocent lives is by not having compassion on the person who is not innocent, is by doing everything possible to eliminate the person who is not innocent, then it's a mitzvah to do that. Meaning it's an obligatory thing. Everybody's talking about the fact that this, this monster, this terrorist murder, is, uh, was not well. He was crazy. He wasn't getting any action. He wasn't having fun. So therefore he decided to kill people. What's his motive? I don't care what his motive is. He's a monster. A person who is insane, according from the Torah perspective, can't find change. You can't count as change. You send him to the store with 10 bucks to buy a newspaper and he brings you back a quarter. That means somebody is insane. Can't count as change? He's insane. Guy knows how to rent a car? He knows how to find a strip of area where he knows pedestrians are going to be walking? 
and there's no cement to get in his way, and he knows how to drive fast, and he knows how to aim for those people, and he looks angry, he's crazy. Everybody's crazy. You know what the Gemara says? Ein Adam Ever Avera Ella Im Kain Nichnas Bedrachtos. A person doesn't sin unless he experiences temporary insanity. Tell me Bill Clinton is not crazy. The man managed to become president after doing who knows how many Averis. Who knows how many terrible things. And he got away with everything. And he managed to become president. What are you sugar? What are you doing? What did you do with this Monica girl? What did you do with her? You had your whole your whole like, <laughs> Your future went up in smoke. Forever till the end of time. If people will ever remember there was a President Clinton, they'll remember there was a Monica Lewinsky. Tell me that's normal. That's not crazy. <laughs> Bench is Meshuggah. He's out of his mind. What did you do that for? What did you gain already? Of course it's a crazy thing to do. Okay. It's crazy. Sin is crazy. The wages of sin are never worth paying the price. People get filled with, they get driven insane by their passion, by their lust, by their desire, by their craving, and they do stupid things, even crazy things. <laughs> That's my friends, that doesn't mean you're exonerated. A person who made the decision to kill innocent people. I know a dentist here in this show who was called last night to, to, because one of the victims was a woman in her 90s, and he's her dentist. I have to go middle of the night to get her dental records. They can identify the body. That's what this monster did. He ran over a 90-something-year-old lady. That is pure evil. That's not insane. That's evil. Everybody's afraid to say the word terrorism. This is terror. What is terrorism? Terrorism is, I, am, I, I believe I can terrorize other people because I have a cause. Whether my cause is pseudo-religious, whether my cause is political, whether my cause is... I'm not getting any action. I don't care what your cause is. I care that you're evil. And evil has to be stopped. And as a society, when we make excuses for evil, we basically are allowing a situation where people almost believe it's their new God-given right. When you have a, a leader of a country who watches a bombers at a, at, a, at a marathon, who ruined people's lives, who ripped their flesh to pieces with their bombs, and he says on public television, they must be feeling really alienated to do something like that. Really? You don't say. They're feeling alienated, eh? Like, what kind of words is that? Well, we have to have compassion. No. Not for monsters. Monsters don't deserve compassion. In fact, monsters don't deserve to live. If you can protect one innocent life by killing a monster, and a monster is an evil person, then it's your obligation to kill him. So we can understand this in a very literal way. You actually see the person driving and somebody could have stopped him. Somebody had a firearm, he could have shot the guy. Nobody had a firearm. Maybe, maybe a police officer would see him, he would shoot him. That would be a hero. That a police officer would shoot this guy, that would have been a hero. To stop him from killing. That somebody would have rammed his car as he was killing innocent people. That would have been a hero. That's a hero. The police officer maybe would be his obligation. The person would have the wits and the courage to ram this guy, to smash his own car, to risk his own life, to save other lives. That would be a hero. But in a broader sense, when we as a society foster and nurture the notion that we have to be loving and compassionate for all, then we're basically greasing the wheels of criminal criminality. People have been insane ever since when? But once upon a time, you didn't hear stories like this every day, every week, every month. When you say that a person is crazy and killed himself, it's very sad. That I, that I remember hearing as a child, that people were crazy and went and killed everybody else, that I don't remember hearing about. But we're fostering this. We're nurturing this. This is Lisamid al Dam We have an obligation to have compassion towards those who are deserving of compassion, towards those who are innocent. And to say statements and to use, uh, talk about prayers and flowers and put tears, fake crocodile tears all over, which is better than not caring at all, at least we're not indifferent. But that's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay when we revel in compassion shown towards a monster. And that's Lysam al Dam And ultimately, if we have compassion, as I said in the beginning, where compassion 
is undeserved, we become cruel and indifferent towards those who are truly deserving of compassion. What should, what should make us compassionate? What should break our hearts? A stroller that was slashed in half. Who knows what happened to the baby? The young and old lives that were snuffed out for no reason whatsoever. That should boil our blood. That should be the object of our compassion. A monster should be the object of our derision. And yes, we have every right to condemn him. Motive could care less. There is no justification ever for mass murder. The Rebish does help, and Almighty God should help us that uh, we shouldn't know of these kind of situations anymore. But I think here, as the Magid said, you have to be a little bit of an atheist. Chas v'shalom. Stop believing in Hashem. But it's time for us to do something. Don't say, hey, God. God in Himmel. And God saying, yeah, you on earth. <laughs> do something. Do something. Make your society safe. Protect innocent lives. Stop making excuses for evil. Condemn evil. Call it what it is. And when evil will be punished, and when, and when there will not be compassion for those undeserving, mm -hmm. we could hope, Emer Hashem, to have a truly humane and compassionate society. And hopefully before that happens, Mashiach will be here already, and there will be an end to suffering and to evil. Because when Mashiach comes, all evil will be gone forever, and the world will be a place that's filled with nothing but the knowledge of God. May it happen speedily and in our days. Amen. Amen.